Thanks, Warwick. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this paper on behalf of my co-authors. Um, okay, so we've written the paper. It'll come out subject to reviewers' comments, etc. I'm just given the time, just select some of the, the key points coming out of, the, out of that paper, and they link quite neatly with a number of papers we've, we've already heard today. So I'll start with my message or the, the question I'm going to leave you with, um, and that really is that we know nitrogen carbon accumulation and cycling in soil are closely linked, and this is data back from 1964. Um, on some topo soil showing C and N accumulation neatly linked the longer the time in pasture. And m my sort of discussion point is that contribution, I interpret contribution of resilience really through the role of organic matter in supplying nutrients and giving soil structural benefits, soil water holding capacity, aggregate stability, etc., etc. That requires continual cycling of nitrogen and carbon. And we can't dis disassemble the, the two cycles too much. We know our soils, pasture soils, are well supplied with carbon and nitrogen and organic matter. Um, I'm just posing the question really, that's great, all, orga all, all organic matter is good but should we consciously try and manage for a specific fraction of soil organic matter to improve the resilience of our pastures? And for that particular part of the organic matter I'm talking about, it's a bio biologically active fraction. Look, it's, soil organic matter is complex. It ranges from anything from you know, dead, decaying roots that just entered that phase in the soil right through to highly degraded, highly protected, very old um, fraction of organic matter. It's a continuum, so it's not one, one thing. Soil organic matter is a continuum, and, we can and it will behave differently depending on uh, where in that stage of degradation it is. And we, we tend to think of it in terms of pools of organic matter, and they will behave differently. Now, depending on your research, you might have five pools of organic matter. Um, I'm a simple guy, I'm tending to think in terms of two pools, and that is the biologically active fraction and the rest. And we can see here just an example of that um, from when you plow a soil, this is some Australian work, it's that particular organic C, which is a sort of a fractionation of the bio, uh, approximation of the biologically active, and that's the one that's undergoing the most change over that time. That's where the biological activity is happening. But like I say, not all, all organic matter is important and plays a role. I'm just going to focus on that biologically active. We've heard um, quite a bit about, or, um, about the cycling of nitrogen and carbon and the, the factors that in, uh, affect it. Um, we've got the organic matter sources. A lot of it's coming through the, the root rhizosphere and, and through the plant, but there are other sources as well. And we've heard um, co uh, conversations today from, say, Kate and from Shen Jing about that. We've also heard about the soil biota, the role they play and the complexity. Um, and also the soil habitat's important. So I think somebody mentioned today about compaction and that. We've got to get all of those right. If we hit the sweet spot, what I think what we're trying to achieve is a good soil habitat, labile carbon, resulting in an active soil biota that gives us that soil organic matter turnover that gives us the benefits that we're looking for in terms of soil aggregate stability and soil nitrogen release predominantly, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus release. In our paper, we touch on all of those aspects of the, the engine, if you like, um, organic matter composition, and it's particularly its relation with um, species of plant. Um, we touch on those. Kate did a great job on that today and confirmed our conclusion that it's complicated. And Shen Jing's just done a good job confirming our other conclusion around soil biota and soil biology. That's complicated. I'm taking the high level view. Okay, so how does that nitrogen and carbon turn over? Well, I liken it, and others have likened it to a flywheel. It's going around very quickly. It's going from organic, it's broken down into mineral fractions. Actually, a large proportion of that is then reassimilated back into the soil microbial biomass. That's a gross mineralization and gross immobilization 
uh, process. Some of that leaks out, some of those um, resulting in free mineral nitrogen that's available for uptake or, heaven forbid, lost to the wider environment. The thing is that that flywheel's turning over, well, depending on Stuart Ledgard's published some work saying that that cycle there, that flywheel, is turning over three to 12 times as quickly as that. We did some work in the UK that came up with about six times, which isn't, is in the right ballpark. But it's that thing that's really driving the carbon and nitrogen cycles and generating um, the benefits in terms of aggregate stability and nutrient cycling. Now, to me, that flywheel, that rapid cycling of, of uh, organic matter has benefits, and I'm calling that high reward. One of the rewards we're getting out is that net nitrogen mineralization. And some work done by Gordon Regendrum a few years ago now was showing that relationship between, okay, um, soil organic matter or soil organic N, here soil total N, and the dry matter yield you're getting from that as a result of the mineralization come from that soil organic matter. Um, the other point of that is, so that's what I would call a reward. We're getting nitrogen. And if we look at sort of the midpoint in that graph, we're getting about three tons per dry, of dry matter per hectare during the spring period when this was done, which I guess you could estimate as equivalent to about 100 kilograms of nitrogen. Um, the other point about that high reward is actually the more soil total N you've got, the lower the nitrogen response of the fertilizer you're putting on because it's getting more of its um, response for them from that base nitrogen supply. And if we combine those two graphs there, we confirm that the fertilizer response um, reduces um, the higher the soil organic matter. We published some work on this in 2015 with a, an individual site which showed that. This is the precursor to the work where we've used a, a range of regional sites to show the same sort of thing. Of course, that's high reward, but there's a high risk. If that flywheel's turning around really quickly, the impacts are that if you actually remove the sink, because you've got a great sink there with your pasture, establish roots all year round, taking up that nitrogen. If you remove that sink, that nitrogen will continue to accumulate in the soil and is available for loss, for example, for example leaching, um, if you plough the paddock um, and before, and in the autumn uh, period and you get the drainage afterwards. So, it's great to have the high reward, but that does come with a risk as well. So, in conclusion, that was a real um, you know, high-level summary, but I'm talking in terms of pasture resilience being enhanced by soil biology. Soil biology creating, um, a, uh, well, a pass requires a pasture system that returns regular amounts of label C and N. If we can get that, and the soil biota that turns over that label CNN, we can get the benefits of that in terms of nutrient release and soil structural stability. I didn't really touch on the soil stuff because that will follow. In terms of managing that soil pasture, we really want to manage for soil habitat and label soil uh, carbon and nitrogen. So essentially, that's just a list of some of the things that we could do in terms of protecting our soil habitat Protect, uh, keeping a sink for utilizing that nitrogen and also looking at the types of materials that we return to the soil to keep that nitrogenous carbon cycling through the soil. So, thanks. <laughs>